We greet you this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as you will see in your bulletin, there is a call to worship and a response from the congregation. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. Let's take our hymnals and turn to number 367. Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. And we'll stand to sing 367. Heavenly Father, how we thank you that it belongs to us because of what Jesus did, not because of what we have done. Ours is the cross, the grave, the skies. Alleluia. Amen. We thank you, Father, for the resurrection of our Savior. Without it, we have no hope. With it, there is eternal life. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this service. We thank you for the hearts that you have prepared to hear your word. We thank you, Father, that Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. You may be seated. Our first portion of Scripture for today is from the Gospel of Matthew. I'll be reading Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 62, and reading through chapter 28, verse 20. Matthew chapter 27. Verse 62. 
God's word for his people. Now, the next day that followed the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, After three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead! So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch. Go your way, make it as sure as ye can. So they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow, and for fear of him the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come. See the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, all hail! And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, See, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Amen. Please take your hymnals. You remain seated, but please turn to number 368, I Serve a Risen Savior. Number 368. Hey, hey, hey. 
Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy past. The day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. I know there is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives Along life's narrow way, he lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. serve a risen Savior. Amen. The next portion of scripture which I'll be reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16. I'll be reading verses 1 through 20. Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 20. Again, God's word for his people. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples, and Peter, that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, 
believed not. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen and amen. Please take your hymnals and turn to number 365. Again, you may remain seated. 365, Alleluia, Alleluia. from Luke chapter 24. I'll be reading the first part of this chapter. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 32. Again, God's word for his people. And now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you, when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, and returned from the sepulcher, and told all these things unto the eleven, and to all the rest. 
It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales. And they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulchre and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. And behold, Two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about threescore furlongs. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And he saith unto them, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished which were early at the sepulchre. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it, even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then he said unto them, O oh, fools! and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went. And he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it, and brake and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. And he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the Scriptures? Amen. Here ends again the reading of God's holy word. May he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Amen. Please take your hymnals and turn to number 357, Christ Arose. We'll stand to sing this one. Hymn number 357, let's join in standing and singing all the verses. 357. <laughs>
now from Luke chapter 24, verses 33 through 53. Again, God's word for his people. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them saying, The Lord is risen indeed, saying, And hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way, and they told how he was known unto them in the breaking of bread. And as they spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? Why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed unto them his hands and his feet. And while they believed not yet for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a, a piece of broiled fish and of an honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany. 
And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Amen. Please turn to number 361, Worship Christ, the Risen King, number 361. John chapter 20. I'll be reading verses 1 through 31. John chapter 20, verses 1 through 31, if you'd like to follow along. God's word for his people. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter unto the sepulchre and came first to the sepulchre, and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went into the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie, 
and the napkin that was about the head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed, for as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if you have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord! But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. 
Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Amen. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May he bless our hearts with a deeper understanding of it. Amen. Please take your hymnals now and turn to number 360, 360. Jesus Christ is risen today, number 360. And we'll stand and sing. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago out of Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. Today the message is entitled, Why Seek Ye the Living Among the Dead? In verses 1 through 12, we have read that was the question that the angels asked in verse 5, and as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you while he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. On this bright and early morning, we remember and celebrate the most joyful sunrise since the creation of the world. On the first day of creation, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. On the first day of the week, light came into the world, and on the first day of the week, Christ, the light of the world, rose from the dead. On the first day of the week, the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit to fulfill the day of Pentecost. On the first day of the week, every week, the church has, since her birth, celebrated the resurrection of our Lord. Our celebration today was first announced by angels, heard by women, spread by the apostles, was seen by over 500 Christians at once. Our joyful celebration today struck screeching terror into the hearts of hardened soldiers, produced chaos and confusion among hypocritical religious leaders, resulted in the payment of huge bribes to spread lies, and ended with the political manipulation of the ruling governor. 
But all of the political, pseudo-legal and mafia-like religious machines of the ancient world and all the rubbish theologians down to this present day could not crush the Rose of Sharon, could not trample the lily of the valley, could not extinguish the blinding light of salvation, could not deny by death the overwhelming power of life, and could not stop the mouths of the witnesses who knew that what they had seen was true. The resurrection of Christ was no small event. It started with an explosion of the supernatural, rattled the foundations of the apathetic religion, turned an entire empire upside down, hypercharged lackadaisical sluggard disciples, replaced frantic fear with ferocious faith, passed from hand to hand with intense speed, passed from lips to hearts with regenerating power, and reached down from the highest rulers and the most august supreme courts down to the depths of the lowest stinking prisons. Christ is risen. The victory is won. There is no fear of death. We are free. Two years ago, we rejoiced that this celebration is a relay race with a baton handed from each faithful Christian to others, from each faithful father to his faithful sons, from each faithful mother to her faithful daughters, from each faithful man to other faithful men, from each faithful generation to the next faithful generation, from each faithful nation to other faithful nations for the past 2,000 years. Some have dropped the baton. Some have been murdered as they ran the race. But other faithful men have picked up the baton and carried it high so that others might hear and see. Last year, we saw that the race started with angels. Angels cleared the track. Angels announced the race. It was an angel that fired the starting gun. It was angels that watched the runners get off on their marks. And it is angels who continue to watch with excitement and the greatest of interest as the runners plunge with determination through the grueling course, overcoming deadly obstacles, fighting battles along the way, facing sword and spear, lion and bear, fire and drowning, hatred and persecution, nakedness, perils, heat, cold, sword, rejection by family and friends, mocking by reprobates, imprisonment and death by governments, and the most intense savage revenge by supernatural demonic forces. But still the heroes race on with bleeding feet, wounded bodies, gasping breath, breaking bones, wrenching muscle spasms through the blinding rain and dark with the evil beasts of hell racing behind, clawing at their backs and their legs as they run, dodging their killers, climbing the cliffs while vicious birds of prey attack their blood-drenched heads. And they are our example. The resurrection news has always been like a marathon relay through all the church history. It's a relay that's been run through the early morning dew, through the heat of the noonday sun, the fog and shrouded twilight. The baton has become a torch as it is carried into the black darkness of midnight through the long and lonely night, eagerly awaiting the dawn sun. There have been dangers. There has been ambush. There have been wild beasts along the way. There have been deceptions and treachery and sufferings and cruel tortures and death. There have been apostates and heretics who have turned aside with the torch into false doctrine. There have been slothful, careless, worldly messengers who brought shame to the Lord Jesus, who put the baton into the hands of that first set of runners. But there have been others who, with determined stride, solid grip, set jaw, eagle eye, have pierced through the darkness, carrying the flaming baton through the night toward the break of day. Are you one of them? Or do you hesitate, piddle around, shuffle your feet, yawn and stretch, read the junk mail, turn back, drop the baton, stop for a hot dog, watch the cheerleaders, waste time, argue about mundane trivia and things that don't like at church, take a nap, slip anonymously into the crowd, make a feeble excuse that you don't feel well, shrink fearfully with the challenge, ultimately disobey your Lord who thrusts you into the race. Yes, you are in the race, whether you like it or not, and you will give a sober account to the judge of the race, Jesus himself. But today we want to consider the insanity of looking for the living among the dead. You can almost hear the incredulous tone of voice as the two angels at the tomb ask the question, Why seek ye the living among the dead? As some of you know, just a few days ago, I was in Alabama, standing, and then kneeling with tears in my eyes at Judy's grave. My hands folded in prayer on top of her tombstone, and as I prayed, 
I wept. But I prayed with thanksgiving for the marvelous woman that she was. For the many years of joyful service that we had together. For her love for the Lord Jesus Christ. For the blessing of all the children that God entrusted to us. And I shook as I wept. I know from the depths of my heart the pain that the women felt as they came to the tomb. But friends, there was a great difference in my visit to Judy's grave. I have enormous human sorrow in my heart. A sorrow that God is using to burn away the dross from my life. And I want you to know that I truly thank him that he is using this painful experience to conform me to the image of Christ. Even though it's the greatest pain that I've ever experienced in the race of life. But here is the difference. I know with certainty and believe in all my heart that the resurrection is coming for all those who have died in Christ. And that has changed my life. And I know with certainty and believe with all my heart that it will happen at the rapture and that if I am still alive in this body when it happens, Judy will be raised in less than a twinkling of an eye before I'm caught up to the clouds to be with Christ and to see her again. Paul writes of this in 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put an incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death! is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That cemetery is a very beautiful place. It's a peaceful, quiet place in the tranquil countryside. A place where many Bible-believing Christians are buried. A place that will be mostly empty when the trumpet sounds. But it is still a place of the dead. The verses that I just read from 1 Corinthians 15 are engraved on the back of that same tombstone under my name. They are a rock of hope and comfort for me. They are a testimony of my confident faith, weak though it is. They are a guaranteed promise given by God himself because Christ is risen from the dead. You know, I did not go to that cemetery expecting to find Judy alive, walking, talking, smiling, excitedly waiting for my passionate embrace. Her body is in the grave. Oh yes, I know that she's very much alive at this moment, more alive than she ever was on earth. She's alive in heaven, and I will see her again someday soon, whether by death or at the rapture. But I did not go seeking the living among the dead. But the women did. That's why the angels asked the women the question, 
Why seek ye the living among the dead? The woman were, women were doing something that was of utter surprise to the angels. They were doing something that perhaps the angels even thought was really stupid and utterly bizarre. Why seek ye the living among the dead? The women had been followers of Jesus. They had heard him speak on a daily basis. They had heard his commands, rebukes, words of comfort, teaching, wisdom, and exposition of scripture. They had seen his example. They had experienced his power. Mary Magdalene, for one, as we just read, had experienced his power to cast out demons. They had seen his miracles, healing the deaf, dumb, blind, turning the water to wine as only the Creator could do, healing lepers, cripples, and others without, with those debilitating diseases. Perhaps most incredible of all, they had seen him raising the dead. They had heard him expound the Messianic Psalms, which promised, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. This is Psalm 16, verse 8 and following. Therefore my heart shall be glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. But incredibly, on that morning, the women were at the tomb hoping to anoint his body with fragrant spices. Do you get that? His dead body. The body that they didn't want to rot and stink, even though the scripture promised that it would not. All that they had seen and believed with their heads had fallen short of true faith. We know this because what you really believe changes your life. If it doesn't change your life, you don't really believe even if you give vigorous assent to it in your head. Note well, if you're still living a life of slothful indolence, doing the same old things as before, making the same old excuses, being content with the status quo, never trying to move to more perfectly obey what you know, showing no eager anticipation of the return of Christ, having no active witness that would make things uncomfortable for you at work or among your friends, showing no zeal for the scripture, showing careless indifference to the fellowship of the saints at church, missing most of the services. You know, there are four every week. What's your percentage? Could you pass a class in a pagan college with that percentage? Or being perpetually late? You don't really believe! You're a phony who's only playing church. Or perhaps... You're really, really dumb, foolish, and faithless like the women who didn't really believe that the tomb would be empty. The angels asked the question, Why seek ye the living among the dead? Because they had personally seen and worshipped Jesus ever since he created them. They knew that he always told the truth. They knew that he never lied. They knew that he had omnipotent power. They knew that he was God. They knew that death could never chain God down. They knew what the inspired scriptures had said. They knew that the scriptures never made a mistake. And so, as they reprimanded the women, they're shocked, surprised, and perhaps even amused, if angels can be amused, that the women hadn't put two and two together and that they had actually shown up at the tomb expecting Jesus to be dead. An utterly inconceivable thought to the angels. Sadly, the women are like most Christians today. They base their defective theology on their experience and reason rather than basing their experience and reason on true theology. The women had all seen death. The women knew from experience that death was the end. Oh, true, they had seen a few people raised from the dead by Jesus, but they knew the odds. How many people did that happen to? And how could a dead man raise himself? Realistically. Reason, you know, it just doesn't happen. Reason tells you plainly that when you're dead, you're dead. You know, it's just like the charismatics that base their theology on their experience of speaking in tongues without realizing that the flesh and the devil can do a pretty good imitation job of tongues. You say, yeah, yeah, that's those charismatics, bad charismatics. But I'm reformed. 
I don't base my theology on experience. I base my theology on Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Faith. Oh, really? I suspect that most of you have never read Calvin's Institutes. I definitely know that you haven't read them in French. If you did, you would discover that Calvin always went back to the Scripture to prove his points, and that's where you should go as well. Truth is not based on either reason or experience, and it's not based on the writings of man. It's based on the revelation of God, the Bible. If you start anywhere else, you will have a defective, disobedient, stupid theology, just like the women at the tomb. They had heard the truth. They knew the truth in their heads. But they proved that they really did not believe the truth because of what they did. They expected Jesus to be dead. You prove what you really believe by what you do. The angels knew this, and that's why they asked the question, Why seek ye the living among the dead? <laughs> Pretty dumb. Earlier at the tomb of Lazarus, Martha had given intellectual assent to absolutely true theology without really believing it. She proved that she did not really believe it because she did not act on what she knew. She merely parroted back what the rabbis and Jesus had taught, that at the last day everybody would be raised from the dead. But she hadn't really believed that Jesus is the resurrection. You see, that would have changed her life. That would have changed the reason that she sent for Jesus. That would have filled her with joy when Jesus came instead of her almost pouting, almost accusatory remark, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. John 11. Many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him, but Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Did you get that? Martha didn't answer his question directly. Martha did not say to Jesus, Wow, that means you can raise Lazarus right now. How exciting. Martha did not say to Mary with excitement, Come quickly, Jesus is about to raise Lazarus from the dead. We know that she did not give any hope for the resurrection of Lazarus to Mary, even after that incredible conversation with Jesus, when she whispered to Mary secretly because of what she actually said and what Mary said to Jesus when she came to him. Verse 28, Martha went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. She didn't tell him anything else about the resurrection, did she? As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Just like Martha had said, Martha had given her no hope. Martha had not mentioned the resurrection. Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Isn't it sad? Mary and Martha and all the other Jews went to the tomb of Lazarus, expecting to find a dead man. And sure enough, when they got there, they found a dead man. And they assumed that he had already begun to rot and stink. He was dead when they arrived at the tomb, but life had just walked on the scene. Life was about to conquer death. Roll back the stone! With Lazarus, the stone was rolled back so that Lazarus could come out. With Jesus, the stone was rolled back so the disciples could go in. 
Men rolled back the stone of Lazarus. Angels rolled back the stone of Jesus. Nothing can stop the supernatural power of God. You know, there are many churches that are dead today. There are many people who will be going to church today for Easter egg hunts and hearing warm, fuzzy sermons about how much fun we can have on Easter, all decked out in their fancy Easter costumes. They'll maybe even have some warped old man dressed up in an idiotic Easter bunny suit so that children can sit on his lap for pictures. Lots of people will be giving Easter baskets filled with chocolate eggs and peeps, those odd little pink and yellow weird tasting greedy surface rabbits and chicks made out of marshmallows, as if that had anything to do with the resurrection of Christ. Many will be ignorantly celebrating with things tracing all the way back to Ishtar, the Babylonian goddess of sex and fertility. It blows the mind. Why do Christians mix the truth with raw, blatant paganism? It's beyond comprehension. Yeah, everybody says amen. We criticize all that. But you know something? It's very close to the unbelief that the women showed at the tomb that morning so long ago. The unbelief that sometimes sits in the pews even of this church. Why seek ye the living among the dead? But the women knew the truth. They had heard the truth. We know this for a fact because that's what the text states specifically. He said, unto, he is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, the Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Look at verse 8. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. They didn't hear those words for the first time from the angels. They remembered the words, but you see, because they had not been practicing the truth, they had not been practicing the truth, it had drifted from their conscious thinking. It had fallen into disuse. It had been shoved into the filing cabinet labeled truth for someday, but not for now. They remembered his words. Jesus had told them. They had all been at that lecture. They all knew that Jesus had warned that he would be turned over to sinners to be crucified and rise the third day, not someday at the resurrection. We're astonished. How could anybody forget that if they heard it from the lips of Jesus himself? Ah. Oh. We point the finger at ourselves. How easy it is to forget the essentials when we major on the minors. You know, it's easy to forget if you don't put into practice what you know. A pianist easily forgets how to play with precision if he doesn't practice. An artist easily forgets certain techniques if she doesn't draw every day. Some of the basics will obviously stick, but the ability to play major works by Beethoven, Chopin, Bach, Mozart, Handel, Grieg, Debussy, Ravel, Brahms, Rossini, Mendelssohn, or Liszt rapidly disappears from the stiffening fingers. We can certainly be thankful that God does not let the angels give up on us just because we are stupid, stubborn, forgetful, or thick-headed in our belief in the scriptures. Angels watch us all the time. We've looked at that in the past, so we won't repeat it here. But there are always angels around us as ministering spirits for those who will be the heirs of salvation according to Scripture. And angels will be there when our spiritual warfare, our days in the battle and our time of suffering comes to an end to carry us into the presence of our Lord. It says so in Luke 16, verses 19 through 23. Remember, angels are the ones that God sent to the tomb on that first resurrection morning to remind the women that the word of God is true. It is true even when it flies in the face of experience and reason. It is true because it was given by Christ himself, the living word, the one who is the resurrection and the life, the one who spoke and it was so. And now we need to ask the question of ourselves. Are we like the women at the tomb? Do we still live our lives as though this morning is a vague point of interesting history? 
Are we totally unchanged in the way that we attack each day, totally devoid of any enthusiasm and zeal for serving Christ? Do we yawn, stretch, and then go about business as usual? We have the truth. Christ is risen. The victory is won. There is no fear of death. We are free. If you really understand and believe in the resurrection power of Christ, it will totally change the way you live your life. The way that you approach every day, the way you analyze what you're going to do with the remaining time that God has given to you on earth, how you prioritize your time, your energy, your resources, your opportunities, your gifts, your witnessing and service. You know, I like to pass out tracts, but I don't always do it even when I know I should. I carry tracts in my car and van, and sometimes I conveniently forget However, on occasion, God sends me an overwhelming sense that I must give a tract to someone. That happened to me on this trip to Alabama this past week. It was still early morning and dark. I had just left Daniel and Anastasia's home and stopped for gas before starting out. On the opposite side of the pumps was a guy with long gray hair tied up in a bandana. He was pumping his gas into a beat-up pickup truck. I had an urge to give him a track, but I shrugged and kept on pumping my own gas. I had stuck a tractor already into the little plastic pocket advertising that particular gas company's credit card, so I figured I'd done my duty for the day. I finished pumping my gas and got into the van. The urge hit me again, this time painfully strong. Get out and give him a tract! I got out with a tract, but he had already gotten into his truck with the window closed. So I got back into the van. My conscience literally screamed at me. If you don't give him a track, you will regret it for the next 14 hours of your drive. I looked over. His truck was still there. I got out again and walked over to his window and knocked on the glass. <laughs> he looked up surprised and rolled down the window. Uh, here's something you might like to read, I mumbled. He smiled and took it gratefully. Thank you very much, he said. There was a burden that suddenly dropped from my heart. God had prepared his heart to receive that tract. Oh, how many times I've tried to give people tracts and they refuse them. But God prepared that man's heart in the dark morning. A guy who sort of looked like a 60s hippie. I began to pray for him that God would also open his heart to hear the gospel and be saved. Tears came to my eyes again as I wondered what would have been the results if I had not given him that tract. How has the resurrection of Christ changed your life? Or are you still like the women at the tomb as the angels looked at them in disbelief and wondered, why seek ye the living among the dead? Would they ask us, why in the world are you still living like that if you really believe the resurrection? Without the resurrection, there is no hope. Without the resurrection, there is no glorious finale. Without the resurrection, there will be no angelic chorus joined by every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that in them are. Without the resurrection, there will be no paean of praise from those who have been redeemed by God by the blood of the Lamb out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Without the resurrection, we shall never experience being made unto our God kings and priests. Without the resurrection, we shall never reign on earth with Christ. The resurrection is not only the truth of the past and the hope of the present, it is the guarantee of the glories of the future. Without the resurrection of Christ, we, as Paul so well put it, of all men are most miserable. So how has the resurrection changed your life? That's the proof that you really believe. There's no better way to express our thanksgiving and longing for that future day of glory than to mirror what all the redeemed will do in heaven. Because this is, in fact, how we will express our joy in eternity with the myriads of angels and the redeemed of all ages. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. 
and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you that we serve a risen Christ and how that should change our life if we really believe what your word has declared which was seen by witnesses who gave their lives because they knew that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept for since by man came death by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Someday we shall see him and stand before him and give an account for what we claim we believed, but he will say, how did it change your life? We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is printed on the back of your bulletin this morning. Alleluia.